And how appropriate at Northminster that we're continuing our Family Matters series. Uh, in this uh, spring summer series, we've been looking at what, what really is the matter and what matters most in terms of our family of faith, uh, who we are as church, your Christian faith with mine, us together operating in the world. Uh, I like how the writer Bob Goff once said, Jesus didn't come into this world to make us nice. Jesus came to make us family. Family. That's us in the church in the world. And as you probably know, unlike your friends, <coughs> you don't get to pick your family. Forrest Gump was right. Our family members come in all assorted personalities, <coughs> excuse me, and types. It's like a box of chocolates. And one of my favorite parts of being church is how God puts us together in such a crazy mixed assortment. I love it. Love it. And I believe God does that so that in our assortment of personalities and gifts and skills, we can represent the body of Jesus in the world today. And over all this body, friends, there is a heavenly Father who gives us life. Today in our scripture reading, we're looking at a scene in which Jesus is praying. He's talking to his Father, and we have the privilege of listening in. It's a prayer of our Lord that I often like to call the real Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer that we know and say uh, was really a teaching template prayer given by our Savior to us disciples. But in John 17, we overhear Jesus praying to his Father. It's the longest recorded prayer of Jesus that we have. It's intimate. Jesus addresses his Father in a more casual, uh, relaxed way than most rabbis did at that time. And it's Jesus' prayer before dying. But we should notice that Jesus does not pray like a typical dying man. Jesus prays to his Father about life, not death, glory, not defeat, and he prays for us. He prays for you. Let's turn in our Bibles to the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, and we dive into his prayer, listening to Jesus' words, picking this up at verse 20. Jesus prays, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Gracious, holy God, we thank you for this reading of your word. Help us now, Holy Spirit, 
guide my words, assist our listening, that we might know you and follow you in faith. Amen. I'm telling Dad. In my house growing up as a little kid, that was the nuclear button of total destruction. That was the worst threat you could give your sister or brother. I'm telling Dad. You know, when I was a kid, Dad equaled NATO or the Pentagon or the World Council of Supreme Powers that order the universe. And I'm sorry, ladies, um, all due respects, I'm telling mom was lower grade. And that's, I think, simply because you moms have this wonderful nurturing uh, chip device in you, in your hearts, compared to most dads. In my house, the dad was kind of the ultimate authority. And it seemed when I was little, he only, uh, he only made appearances in the evenings and on the weekends. And, and I was told that's because he worked all day to put food on our table, which I thought was strange. Uh, why was the food never put on the counter or maybe on TV trays? It was always on the table. And we were told that dad's main job was to put a roof over our heads. And again, I wondered, were we not concerned about the walls? Because that's where my brother and I did the most decorating and sometimes damage. And in my home, dad was the enforcer who sometimes would get angry or upset with us, especially if we made mom cry. Oh, I'm telling dad. That was the nuclear threat that would come for your sister or brother. And now there was a mother version of the nuclear button, and that was, wait till your father gets home. So uh, in honor of dads everywhere, we love you. Uh, I thought I'd share briefly some things you'll never hear a dad say. Now, uh, originally this was from a top 10 list, but I'm going to be quick here and just share my favorites. Top things you'll never hear a dad say. Number 10, well, what do you know? I'm just plain lost. Looks like we'll have to stop and ask for directions. Here's number seven. Hey. Here's a credit card and the keys to my new car. You kids go have fun. You'll never hear a dad say that. Number four. Honey, I have no clue what's wrong with your car. It's probably just one of those doohickey thingies. Just tow it to a mechanic and pay whatever he tells you it'll cost. You won't hear a dad ever say that. Here's number two. What do you want to go and get a job for? These are your fun years. I've got plenty of money for you to spend. Relax. <laughs> and here's number one of the things you'll never hear a dad say. What do I want for Father's Day? Ah, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Now, they might say that last one, but friends, good authority. They don't mean it. So friends, how's your life going? And how would you feel if I told you I'm going to go tell dad? And have you thought lately about some of the dad crises we're having in America today. You know, over the last 50 years, we've seen a marked decline in the importance and role of fathers in society. Many have developed a mistaken view of androgyny, which is a belief that gender roles relating to raising a child no longer matter. It's accepted by many, including some psychologists, that children don't really need a father to develop well. And to make matters worse, you know this, 
Many dads have been completely irresponsible in our communities. Since the 1960s, the statistics on children born out of wedlock, divorce, cohabitation, along with the uh, sickening number of deadbeat dads who fail to provide for their children, it leads to poverty in our communities, personal debt levels rising, and crisis life challenges for mothers. Michael McManus, an author and counselor, has reported that on our American scene, no civilization in the history of the world has seen such a massive abandonment by fathers of their responsibilities to their children. And so on this Father's Day, I'm preaching a word of recovery and goodness for our communities, for our children, and for our dads. And so I want us to reflect on the goodness of a good father and the goodness of our heavenly father operating in our lives. Friends, Jesus needed his father. Can we start there? The words of John chapter 17 in our Bibles is our chance to overhear Jesus talking to his dad. As I said, it's direct, it's intimate. And a good portion of Jesus' prayer to his father is about you and me. After a section in his prayer in which he prays for his immediate disciples nearby, Jesus goes on to pray for the next generations of disciples. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's you. If you're a person who has taken a personal step of faith and trust, of opening and committing your life to Jesus Christ, if you're a believer of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, friends, you can write your name right there in the margin of your Bible. You can write, Jesus prays for me, Andy. Only you should use your first name. I mean, since it's your Bible, it, so you put your name, then not mine. Jesus was concerned that we would receive the love and glory of his Father today. And that we would live in the unity of Jesus and God today. God's bonding love with one another. And so Jesus prays a good prayer to our good heavenly father for the goodness of his mission working in life today. And in fact, it's glorious because it uses the word glory. And that's because friends, in Jesus and God's eyes, you are not just plain, ordinary. And it's also because God the father is not just the big guy in the sky whom you only call when you're in trouble. Friends, you are not plain, tasteless yogurt in God's eyes. You've got fruit to stir up from the bottom. <laughs> and that fruit becomes stirred up when you open your life in a love-faith connection with God the Father. And so let us think about the goodness of a good father operating in life. The first thing we see in our scripture is that a good father raises you knowing you are loved. You know, I, I've learned as a parent of three that parenting doesn't end when your kids go off to school or graduate from college or even when they're old and in their 30s and, and have their own homes. And can I just tell you, my kids so need me. Oh, oh, it's really quite touching. But welcome to the number one job of being a dad, letting your kids know that you're there for them at whatever stage of life they're in. And here's the key, letting them know that nothing will stop your love for them. 
You know, looking back on my childhood, yes, my dad put a roof over our head. And yes, he put food on the table. But, you know, now as I think about him, he's been promoted to glory. It was my dad's love for me in his heart that just fuels me to this very day. It gets at the core of who I am, that I am loved by a dad, biological, uh, earthly, but also heavenly. Jesus understood and lived this love, and it's why he prayed. We see it in our reading. I and them, you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. It's this love of our good Father that begins to motivate and build our unity connection with spiritual siblings, one another in the church. Now, the problem, though, is that there are so many in this world living outside of that love bond connection, which we can share in God. Many not knowing how a love like God the Father through the Son can change them, reorient them, give hope. Some of you may know the story about the boxer George Foreman. And how he named all his sons George after himself. And if you're like me, when I first heard that story, uh, your reaction might have been laughter or maybe disgust. How egocentric can you get to name all your kids after yourself, your own name? But in an interview, George Foreman explained why he did this. He said, growing up, he never knew who his father was. And he was often picked on, shamed, because he did not have a dad. He said he grew up with a hole in his identity, never knowing who he really was because he did not know his dad or receive a dad's love. And so he explained that he wanted to dedicate himself by being a better father to his sons and by giving each of them his own name, he meant to give them a gift of clear and loving identity. He wanted them to know he was proudly claiming them as his very own. Isn't this why Jesus is offering us here in this prayer his life? And isn't this why we can gladly claim the name Christian, Christ one, today? Friends, your baptism is a sign of this newly claimed identity. When we baptize children or adults at Northminster, we baptize them in the name of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and also the Father. It's a forever marking and naming of who we are now in our new life with Christ. When you join the church, you profess your faith, but further, you are baptized, which is a, a sacrament sign of our bond, life connection, covenant with God the Father, but also with one another, sisters, brothers in the church. God wants his love to be that real, that present. Secondly, friends, a good father helps you grow up as set apart. Set apart is a concept in our reading. We see it in the words consecrated or holy. Earlier in his prayer, Jesus prayed that as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Sanctified is a word that literally means holyified, set apart, holy for special use, godly use, special, distinctive, shaped by God's values. You know, I, I don't have to tell you that right now in our country and in the world, we're seeing the 
social effects of good and bad values? Do we value others enough around us to wear a face mask uh, out of care and concern? Do we value others of different skin colors and cultural backgrounds as creations of God who deserve just and honoring treatment and respect? I believe in these challenging days that we're in right now, we are in a classroom in which we're relearning how values matter and that who we are, how we are raised, and how we're continuing to grow up in our God the Father's design is so key. I, I love, years ago, Ann Landers in her help column received this touching letter from a 13-year-old son written for uh, his father. He says, Dear Dad, I wish I had some money so that I could buy you a neat present for Father's Day. I'm broke. So please let this letter be your present. I like the way you talk to me when I am down. You always make sense. You always make me see the things that aren't so bad and that they will get better which they always do. I like the way you don't let me get away with much. Sometimes I act mad when I don't get my way, but deep down, I'm glad you are strict. I would be scared to death if you let me do anything I want. I like the way you tell me the truth about everything. When I grow up dad and have kids, I want to be like you. Jesus called his dad righteous father because if his father was not completely holy, completely righteous, then there truly would be no salvation hope in our world today. Jesus' prayer is that the same rightness of God would more and more be growing in us as we're living by God's holy standards, impressing them on our children, grandchildren, church children, so that many others will be blessed, helped, and, and shaped in godly ways for our world. Here's a third idea from Jesus' prayer. A good father guides you in living so that you're shining. And shining is my word for how to face the world in a way that shines, not sags. Shining, friends, is what you were made for. To reflect the goodness and hope of God to others. I remember years ago, my old karate teacher would always teach brand new kids who came into the school. Uh, he, the first lesson was always how to stand and meet an adult, look them in the eyes, and shake their hands. It was a bygone era when we used to shake hands kind of thing. But I would always smile and think of my dad. That was something my dad taught me when I was a kid. To look an adult in the eyes to smile, shake their hands, and treat them with respect. Jesus prays here that we who believe in him should be able to face the world and shine as his witnesses, his representatives. Because Jesus says, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me then the world will know. Friends, this is our role and function, shining as a witness of Christ in our words, in our actions, even in our attitudes. And in this prayer, we see that a key to seeing the love of God in us from the world's viewpoint is the unity and bond we share as church in spite of our family differences. In all these ways, Jesus prays that we would know the Father's love, that we could grow in our lives as set apart, distinctive, belonging to Christ, and that we could be living so that we're shining. I, I want to ask you, have you pondered how God is answering Jesus' prayer in you? God answered Jesus' prayer 
through the cross. Jesus willingly suffered in our place and died on the cross so that the mission of God's love could be brought to you today. The love of the Father was in the heart of the Son, and that heart would willingly suffer and die so that God's hope and salvation could be exchanged for us. If you have said yes to this offer of love, yes to Jesus, you are a part of the answer to Jesus' prayer. Let me ask you a question. If you could picture Jesus looking at you now, face to face, and if Jesus said to you, I'm telling dad about you, would that give you great relief or fear? And what might that say about your view of our Heavenly Father? In this prayer of our Savior, friends, we hear Jesus' last will and testament for his disciples, for all disciples. Jesus prays, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. That's the heart of our good Father, revealed through the heart of His Son, Jesus, given for us. It's a love that is offered to you today. And it changes your whole orientation. I love the story that Sherry Lynn Blake tells about her life growing up. She says that when she was five, her biological father committed suicide. And it left her feeling as if she did something wrong. That, that if she had been better somehow, he would have stayed around. Her mother remarried. But when Sherry turned 19, he and her mother divorced. And she said, once again, I was wondering, what's wrong with me that I can't keep a father? Her mother married again, and her new husband, Bob, was a wonderful and caring man. She says, but just a few years after that, her mother was diagnosed with cancer and passed away shortly thereafter. But before she died, Bob came over to Sherry's house to talk over a lot of things. And Sherry says, he told me that he wanted me to know that he'd always be there for me, even after mother was gone. And then she says, he asked me if he could adopt me. Sherry continued, she said, I could hardly believe my ears. She says, tears stream down my face. He wanted me. Me. This man had no obligation to me, but he was reaching out from his heart, and I accepted. She says, during the adoption proceedings in the courtroom, the judge commented and thanked the two of them for brightening his day as he pronounced us father and daughter. And then Sherry Lynn Blake said, you know, at that moment, I was 25 years old, but I was his little girl. Friends, the heart of our Heavenly Father is reaching out to you today. Have you accepted? It's not simply that God is a good father. He wants to be your good father. He wants you. He wants you as his daughter, his son, to be adopted through his son, our Savior. 
I can tell you today, there is one thing our Heavenly Father will never say to you. And that is, I don't love you or I don't want you. He does. Will you say yes to him today? Gracious God. Oh, Lord. We simply say yes to you. Lord, in our hearts, whether this is a renewing time for us or the first big step of faith, uh, Lord, yes. We just can't, I can't do life on my own. God, I want to admit to you that I'm just not strong enough to do life all on my own by myself. Come and help me. Help each of us. Help me to trust in you. To know you are there. Help me every day to learn about you and to walk in your ways. To change my directions. To set a new course, Jesus that's led by your guiding hand. And Lord, as I open my arms to your arms of grace, I celebrate the receipt of your Holy Spirit in me. Deliver me, deliver us. Guide us, set us apart. Help us to shine, Jesus, in and through you. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen.